Let's talk about a fresh topic, Donald J. Trump. Um, in 2016, you were almost a non-Trumper or a never-Trumper, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't vote for Donald J. Trump. Right. You didn't vote to Hillary, for Hillary Clinton. No. no. <laughs> um, to, this, to this lady from the Green Movement, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, in 2020, you voted for Trump. Why didn't you vote for him in the first place, and what changed your mind? Okay, so I, I gave several reasons for not voting for Trump in 2016. One was Donald Trump's deep and abiding character flaws, uh, which have not been alleviated at all. Uh, the, the second is that Donald Trump was extraordinarily unclear about what he actually was going to do politically. So he was on all sides of every issue with equal passion. Right, so, uh, so he would say on the one hand that, you know, I think that we should be definitely defending our friends in Israel, and then he'd be like, America should never spend money on foreign, so they, they, it, with the exact same amount of passion, right? <laughs> he, th this was his shtick. And so my math was essentially, I object to everything that is happening in 2016. That was my math. My math was, and I didn't live in a swing state to be granted, you know, I was living in California, so my vote really didn't matter anyway. But with that said, the, the you know, basic calculus was that if I didn't vote in that election, then as a public figure, I had made clear my disdain for all available candidates. Trump came in and he governed way more effectively and way more conservatively than I thought he was going to. And but just a second, let's stop before 2020. Sure. How was it? You have, you have an empire, you have built an, an, an amazing empire. Um, weren't you worried even publicly that by not supporting Trump, you lose your audience and revenues? Of course. I mean, that's why the, the, the kind of silly notion that, that people were taking a position not to vote, that that was done, done for the money, absolutely untrue. I mean, I took the position in 2016 because I fundamentally objected to the candidates that had been presented to the American public in 2016. And you paid the price for that. 100%, yeah. I mean, I lost a job for that in 2016 with Breitbart. Um, but the, but the, um, the, that math changed. I mean, when the evidence changes, if you don't change your mind, then you're not doing your job. And the evidence changed with regard to President Trump. President Trump came into office, he selected a bunch of justices who I thought were going to do a good job on the bench. The day that he, that he selected Neil Gorsuch, I, I literally put a MAGA hat on, on air. Um, you know, President Trump obviously moving the embassy to Jerusalem was a massive, massive move. His sponsorship and negotiation of the Abraham Accords was an incredible history-changing move. Uh, he, he did a lot of things that I really liked. So when it came to 20, and, and that combined with the fact that the left completely and utterly lost their mind in the United States between 2016 and 2020 made my decision a lot easier come 2020. And then came 2021, January 6th. And when you see these, these horrifying pictures of people storming the Capitol Hill, sorry. <laughs> um, it wasn't the best, guys. Don't you think Democrats m might have been right about with this, some of their criticism towards Donald J. Trump? I mean, so... That's your answer, but what's I mean, Ben's answer? The, again, I said that I, I thought that he had deep and abiding character flaws in 2016. My opinion of his deep and abiding character flaws were not changed by his diarrhea addiction to Twitter. Uh, so, no, I mean, I, I don't, like, almost nothing about my opinion about Donald Trump changed at any point as, as sort of a human being. My opinions only changed as far as what policy I thought he was going to implement and then how durable I thought the constitutional boundaries were. And I thought that the, I, I will say, I think it is a major misstatement of fact to declare, as most of the world media has done, that the United States is on the verge of having its democracy overthrown on January 6th. I think it's absurd. You had 200, 300 morons who went into the Capitol building attempting to do harm to people. They were cleared out within two hours. The vote took place under the auspices of Donald Trump's vice president, Mike Pence, and the auspices of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Donald Trump's party. People like Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, Republican Secretary of State, election officials in Arizona and Pennsylvania, Republican Secretaries of State, were rejecting him at every turn. The courts rejected all of his legal complaints. Does that mean that Trump acted well between November 4th and January 6th? I thought he acted horribly between November 4th and 4th and January 6th, I think that he was saying things that were not true. But the, the notion that Donald Trump was presenting a unique threat to the entire democracy, the most durable democracy in modern world history is, is absurd. We were so at no point in danger of the democracy being overthrown so by a dumbass wearing bullhorns in the Capitol building put his feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk. It's ridiculous. So it's yet another protest in the United States of America. That's what you're saying to me, the January 6th I mean, Vince. we had an entire summer in which major cities burned in, in 2020, and nobody in the media seemed to care. So the answer, 
by the way, but that's not an answer for but, both, but it's an answer for neither, meaning both exactly. of those things are super bad, right? And people who facilitate those things are doing something wrong. It's bad when Kamala Harris tries to bail out rioters in the middle of the Black Lives Matter riots of 2020, and it's bad when Donald Trump declares that the, the rioters of January 6th are, are fundamentally doing something patriotic. That's not true. Okay. What do you think about what the uh, former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Ron Dermer once said, that Israel should put its political fortune on the evangelist community rather than on the reform Jewish community? I mean, just as a matter of blunt fact, that's true. I mean, that's a, that it's, a, it's an unfortunate reality of life in, in the United States that uh, reform Judaism as a branch does not see Jewish identity in a serious way as central. Uh, it, it, it's a very simple rubric for me. If, as a Jew, right, if, if as a Jew, your values are more in line with same-sex marriage, transgenderism, and abortion than they are with, for example, the safety and security of the state of Israel, I have serious questions about how you think about yourself as a Jew. And so if I'm looking at who's more likely to back Israel, by polling data, Jews in the United States are the single most atheistic group of quote-unquote religious people anywhere. It's because Jews obviously Save are- Save North Korea, I think. What was that? Save North Korea. I yeah, think. I mean, okay. the, 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 the Jew, well, what's weird about Jewish identity, obviously, is it has an ethnic side because halakhically Jews are ethnically Jewish, and then it has a and then it has a religious side. So when people self-identify as Jews in the United States, that doesn't actually mean that they do anything that has anything to do with Judaism. It means that their their last name ends in, in Berg or Steen or something. Uh, and you know, there are a lot of people whose last names end with Berg or Steen who fundamentally reject nearly all Jewish values and are secular leftists, and so they vote like secular leftists. Okay, um, we are approaching to the questions from the audience, but I have one last question. Uh, for me, uh, you quoted Hamilton, I think, so I want to quote the play Hamilton. <laughs> Do you one day want to be, want to be part, or oh, you want to be in the room where it happens? To be a candidate for a vice president, president? That sounds like hell. Um, <laughs> Number one, running for office is a garbage business. You have to ask a bunch of people that you don't care very much about for large sums of money in order to run a campaign in which you have to fib about your core positions. And then if you win, you have to hang out in Washington, D.C. with politicians. All of this sounds horrifying. I, I, my life is pretty wonderful. I get to spend nearly all my time with my family. I get to say what I want for a living, and, I get to pay, I get, and I'm paid richly for doing so. So I'll stick with that at least until... Uh, I'll, 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 I'll stick with that and le at least until, I'm 38 right now, I'll stick with that at least until I'm of the average age of our president, so that gives me like seven or eight decades. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't hear a no. <laughs> okay. I hope you enjoyed that clip from The Ben Shapiro Show. If you did, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you stay up to date with all our future content.